Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Yo, I got Philly in the building. I got one of the most dangerous spitters to ever touch a microphone in the building. I got my man. Yo, many of y'all know him from MTV's Making a Band. But the new generation probably know him from destroying, destroying opponents in that rap battle league. Yo, please welcome my brother, E. Ness, to the building. Ness, what up? Press? What up, press? Appreciate you, salute, my guy. Appreciate salute, those salute. words, too. Appreciate that. Yo, Ness, you always was like, I, I don't need, you tell me, what is it about Philly? Like, Philly produces some of the illest spitters in the game. You got Beans. Everybody know Beans, Cassidy, uh, Freeway. It's so many just prolific spitters out of that one area. What is the water y'all drinking? <laughs> <laughs> um, Philly just always been rich in music. All we going back to the um, Gambling Huff, the sounds of, uh, you know what I mean, that shit, that whole thing. We just always had a rich... Uh, I would say a uh, 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 presence in music, and with that being said, it just, you know I mean, transcended over time into uh, hip hop and rap and creating rhymes. And uh, it's just, it's just a small Commonwealth city. It's not that big compared to a New York. So we kind of all on top of each other. Pause. In a way where you know what I mean, it's, it's it's so many MCs and so many artists, not enough outlets. So our our way of process of elimination and knowing who's who who should who deserve what is the battling process? That's the process where, you know, one rapper, another rapper, whoever wins, th that guy knows that guy's better than the other guy. So, and, and, and in hindsight, the guy that won would be getting all the looks because he 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 deemed he deemed himself better than another artist that said he he was the S H I T. Yo, it's crazy. So so has battle rap always been a huge part? of the Philly scene? Like, is, is this something y'all grew up with? Because, you know, rap has evolved over the years. I come no, from sure. the era growing up in the South Bronx, growing up in hip hop where you had to be a spitter. You had to be somebody who, like your pin game, it, it, it had to be pristine. No, for but, sure. Like um, back in my era, if you didn't have talent or you didn't have what we considered a pin game, you wasn't getting no looks. But now the climate has changed. Everybody is content creators and really they don't focus too much on the actual craft. And um, before, you know, I mean, my, my pre bad boy days, um, I was stuck inside this kind of zone where I just wrote enough, enough to people for people to say, OK, he's nice. But once I got the bad boy, I realized. One of the things Puff taught me, not, not to bring him in so early, was to write the beats that I didn't particularly write, like. And that strengthened my pen over the years. Also, um, Bad Boy's uh, of, of, of system of writing five verses per verse and then them picking the, the best verse out of those verses to, to insert inside, you know, verse one, verse two, verse three. So per song, I would write 15 verses. So everybody that's asking me, how can you remember your, your rhyme so quickly? I've been put through the Puff Daddy boot camp training for writing verses and, you know, listening to beats and what to listen for and what not to listen for. You know what I'm saying? Yo, first, first and foremost, I, I don't think people fully understand what it was like coming up in that system. I, I can speak from behind the scenes. Right. But you just spoke from the artist standpoint. I know behind right. the scenes... It, it was it was legitimately uh, you had to be a green beret, you had to be yeah. a Navy Seal, an Army Ranger to stand out in that system. But yeah. here you go from the artist standpoint, you like yo, and and a lot of things people didn't catch what you just said. Back in the days, it was three verses per song. These days, you lucky if you getting two verses. But for every verse, you had to write. For every verse, you had to write five different verses for it, and then they would pick the best one? Yes. Yes. Is so crazy. five verses for the first verse, five verses for the second verse, and five verses for the third verse. And then they would pick the best verses out of all those and insert them, verse one, verse two, verse three. 
That's how we got the song My Hood, my, the classic song My Hood. That's craziness. How, okay, notice, so let me notice ask you the this. verses on My Hood don't match the hook. It's because I wrote five of the alternate verses for every verse. And then they just picked the best ones that sonically sounded right. So how long does it take you, even back in them days, to write a verse? Like, you tell somebody right now, give me, give me 15 verses. They might come back to you next week. They're not coming back to you two hours right. later. Not, not only that, we was put under the Bobby Fischer clock, I would say. Anybody know anything about Bobby Fischer? He was a famous chess player. And when they play chess, they usually have a timer. So you hit the timer, and then that uh, that gives you know what I mean that that gives the other chance the, the opponent chance to think about his next move. But he's on a timer, and then he doesn't meet that time limit, then he misses his turn. So think about the time limit. Puff would come in the studio around ten o'clock, and then he would give us the beats to write to. So by the time the club is over, which the club is never over in New York because it's it's, it's all night long, he would come back from the club around two. And he wanted to listen to all 15 verses. So I really had like almost a four hour window to write 15 verses. Damn. And that went for all that all your bandmates? Yeah, all of us. They dreaded Damn. it. They dreaded it, but I knew that um in hindsight it was gonna make me stronger when it came to my pen. I always was a pure writer. Even if I don't write hip hop. I can still write R and B. I can write um, temporary music. I can write pop music. I can write uh, <clears throat> folk mu music. When you're a writer, you can write anything because you have an imagination. You're a creator. <clears throat> so not only that. Um, outside of that, I just want to establish myself as a pure writer, so people to know I can write to any beats per minute, any tempo, any type of beat, trap, down south, snap, hardcore, horrorcore. Uh, jiggy music with it per se, dance hall music. So um, what I would do was get, you know, back back in our day we had the Sycamore CDs. Remember DJ Sycamore? We would come out absolutely. With the CDs. They Shout had to all Sycamore. The instrumentals. He had all the instrumentals to whatever hot music was out at the time. What I would do in my own downtime was take the mixtape with all the instrumentals and write a sixteen to every beat. Whether I liked it or not, just to keep my sword sharp. So when Puff would call me to come write for him or, you know, or to do any type of thing where it would consider me writing, it would cut my time down. So I would be quicker instead of taking four hours to write 15 verses. Now I'm writing 15 verses within an hour and a half. Damn. Yo, you know something? When you got down with the team, who was y'all's <laughs> AR at the time? Was it Harv? Was it Bobby Conrad. Springsteen? Conrad. Oh, that was your AR? Yeah. Conrad. He was my a &R. He was actually the a &R for the band album, and he was the a &R for my solo project. People don't know. People think I just got dropped after the band situation. But even though my album never came out, uh, I, me, Chopper, and Babs were selected to stay on a probationary period. And after I, I, after I got through the probationary period, it, it I landed me a, a solo deal once they went from Universal to Warner Music Atlantic Group. Okay, what you mean by a probationary period? Meaning is I was on probation because of all the hoorah coming from the show and all of the uh, breach of contracts for people not showing up to the meetings and missing flights. Puff put me on a probationary period. Meaning you're on a probationary period. Meaning you come up here with music, you do what you're supposed to do, you do what I ask of you, and I mean you may get rewarded or you may not. Gotcha. Okay, so so let me go backwards for a second. When you auditioned for the band, wasn't you mm -hmm. like legitimately on probation? Didn't you just get, come out of getting locked up a few months ago? No, when I'm saying I'm on a probationary period, I mean a probationary period with Bad Boy. This is what no, Puff no, said I'm to clear me on personally. that. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'm, I'm clear no, on that. Yeah, I was legally on probation. Yeah, I was. I was okay. actually because because before we get into I was the band, on the run on the show, I was actually on the run from the authorities in Philly on the show in New York. To where it came to a point where I had to 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 uh to approach Allison and you know the, the people that was part of the staff to, to to try to get some assistance because I was getting calls from my mother back in Philly saying the police was coming to her residence looking for me. And they she was getting all types of calls and all that stuff. So I couldn't have them um stressing moms out. So it was a problem I had to resolve. So I actually went to Allison which was like the dead mother at the time. She went to Puff and Puff ended up writing me a letterhead 
saying that I had potential of, you know, I mean, possibly being one of the band members for the show. Yo, that's a crazy story, kid. But the flip side to that was Philly jurisdiction don't give a fuck about New York and Puff. So it was a shot in the dark. Once you on the run from Philly jurisdiction and my judge's probation, that means I'm in total violation. Not only was I in violation for going AWOL, I was in violation for being in a whole nother city. That, that, that means you, you're running. You're running. So you're not even supposed to be in another county. So I was, I was all the way out of pocket for two things. And regardless of what Puff sent the letterhead or not, they had all right to just detain me and, 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 and give me all my time back and resentence me. But they didn't. That's how Puff was. That's how powerful Puff was. And it still is to this day. One letterhead got them to release me in his care legally. So a lot of the things that we fought for, I tried to fight with my band members to bring us closer together, but I really couldn't jump over the cliff because I was legally in care. I was legally in bad boys care at that time. Okay. See, I never knew this story. And that's real talk. Even, even when y'all was auditioning, when the group members finally got picked, I didn't realize you was on the run at that time. Yeah, I was on the run. I just wasn't telling nobody because I didn't want people to be like, oh, he's a problem or he's going to be a liability. So you got to remember I'm a kid. And then this is my first time really getting somebody as the stature of a P. Diddy or a bad boy records at this time. You know what I'm saying? I didn't want to mess up my chances. So I just kept quiet. But then when it became an issue with my, you know, my family back home, I didn't even want my family going through that. So I just stepped to Allison and they tried to help me as best as they could. Puff wrote the letter. I took it back down to Philly, went to go see my probation officer. Not only did they let me in his care, but they also like gave me more leg room. Like I didn't have to check in as much. I didn't have to come in down there in person and see them particularly. So they really took their foot off my neck when they seen the letter. Yeah, if you don't mind me asking, what was you in trouble for? What was your legal drugs? Problem? I had a drug charge gotcha. and a gun charge. The gun charge was was thrown out, and I got hit hit with a possession, with with attempted deliver, which is a felony one in, in in Philly. So, how much time was you looking at? Three years. Did you have to do any of it? No. No, I did eleven half to twenty three. I copped out to a a, a county plea. And wind up doing 11 half to 23 in the county. Then I came out, I had a three year tell for probation. When you fuck up during that any three years, they can take away your street time and give you that whole three years over again. So I was looking at three years. So any violation, you got to be detained and then go back in front of the judge that gave you the probation. And then they, they figure out what they're going to do from there based upon mm -hmm, mm -hmm. your, um, your probation, probation officer report. And I mean, I guess whatever drug habit or whatever drug thing you had going on, or if you was in a rehab uh, type of system or type of program or anything like that. Yo, how did you even hear about the auditions? Because you knew you was in trouble. You knew I couldn't leave the state because in actuality, like you said, yo, I'm crossing state lines. How did you hear about the auditions first and foremost and what made you just say, F it, I'm going to go and I'm going to take my chances. I know this could get me locked up and send me upstate for a minute, but I'm going to just take my chances with it. I mean, it's just, you know what I mean, coming from the inner city, coming from single parent um, family, coming from the projects, um, low income housing. It's just nothing really that we have to look forward to. Even though I grew up in, um, I would say, uh, an academic uh, directed family. Like I come from a Christian background. Yeah, I mean, I come from a, a good family. Uh, my, my mother and father was married. They, they still was married until uh, my father's death, which happened January 3rd of this year. So I'm still dealing with that. But um, yeah, I come from a fairly good family. We in real Christian oriented family. But you know what I mean? Me coming from the inner city, not being exposed or living like a middle class family, I started selling drugs to compensate for the things that my mother...
and DJ Drama, we all shared the halls at the same time. Yo, you want to know what's bananas? I, I People forget that Drama is from Philly. Even when you <laughs> said that just now, I, I totally right. forgot that Drama was from Philly. Yeah, DJ Drama's from Philly, yeah. Was y'all was y'all in high school at the same time? Yeah, we was we was all in high school at the same time. Drama was my friend. So you you Before can we came DJ Drama, we, we we had a rapport. We had a rapport cuz we always shared the love for music. So he would do the mixtapes and go down to South Street, which was like the key area for like hip hop back then, underground hip hop. That's where I met Tariq from the Roots, Malik B and all those guys from like the from like the that era, but before the Rockefeller being state property, but for that era, it was a, a sub culture in in Philly. The Roots, um, Rashida Ill Advise, the Fat Cat Click, a couple of groups that was making noise. A hundred X, you know, they was backed by Rashid Wallace. You know, what I mean, he used to play for the Detroit Pistons, so it was a couple groups that was like had noise. Ram Squad. So these was the groups that was like prominent rap groups back then. Non Brigade which went by task force. So there was a couple groups that was making noise. So it was like, when, once I got locked up, I had missed that whole, I'll call it train to Paris. When I say train to Paris, the year I got locked up and did my time was the year that the industry came through Philly and scooped everybody. The Beans, the Eves, the Most Wanted, the Roscoe P. Cold Chains. All those guys got signed the year that I had got arrested. So making a band to me was like the only thing left for me to able to jump over the process of playing my demo and having meeting after meeting to really just get up and close with the guy that can make the decisions. That's dope, kid. That's a super dope story. Uh, it, I mean, it's, it's crazy because when you think about that much talent, it ain't like Philadelphia is New York or it's LA. That it's that's a small place. It's a small place. No, it thing, is. It, yeah. Okay, so I asked you earlier, how did you even hear about the auditions? Because it it's ain't in like the hood. you know chilling. I mean, smoking, talking shit. One of my old heads by the name of Trizzy Mac, he said, you know, they're having the auditions down that uh for the making the banjo. I never knew what it was. But by the by by that time I had signed a production deal, fresh out of jail which was with, was with uh, Black Key. Black Key was a guy that, you know, was from my neighborhood and you know, doing the music thing just like I was. He was a little older than me. So uh, by that time, right before I had got locked up, Black Key had landed two big singles on DMX, the um, Great Depression album. The Who We Be and We Right Here was the lead two singles. And that yep. drove the album to go platinum. So by the time I got out, Black Key had some stain. He had... He had placements on Beans. He had placements on Jadakiss. He had placements on 50 Cent. He had placements on Ludacris. So by the time I got out, the right thing to do was just sign to his production deal because he already had like some, did some groundwork in the business going around selling his beats. So um, his his lawyer at the time was Ed Woods. So I ended up signing to Black Keys Production under Ed Woods. And that's mm. how they was shopping my, my demo around. And I actually got a chance to... Uh, I mean, um, bust it up with X and chop it up with X because when he had his um, bloodline imprint, he was looking for artists then. That's how I met Hitmaker, which we know is now Hitmaker, but back then he was called Young Bird. So DMX was contemplating on signing me, but, you know, he was dragging his feet because he was going through legal troubles and certain personal shit he was going through. So, you know, but he always liked me. He always thought I had the words, the pen, you know what I'm saying? But, you know what I mean? A lot of people. I was with Miss J the B club with the Timberland thing. So I was doing what I was supposed to do. It just wasn't nobody fully opening their doors and unleashing, I mean, opening up. They, you know, they, they stable to me and th yeah, the competition yeah. came like a Willy Wonka chocolate factory golden ticket. And ironically, that was the way that I got to one of the big, you know I mean, playmakers in hip hop. But I already was moonlighting with DMX, Bloodline, already moonlighting with Timberland for his B Club. So I was always doing the rap thing, dropping the mixtapes, opening up for X when it came to Philly. So I wasn't just like the other members. Like me and Babs had dropped projects. We was really like 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 instrument in trying to make it out of career. A couple of other members, I wouldn't say they didn't want it, but they hadn't been doing the grind, the late work that we had been doing up until the audition for making a band. Let me ask you something. What was that audition like for y'all? Like, 
How many people would you say showed up? Was it one round of auditions, two rounds, three rounds? Walk us through that. Yeah. Funny story about that. I auditioned the first time in Philly at the five spot. It's like, um, I would say like, um, I would say it's like the high end part of Philly. But make a long story short, it was a lot. It was a big turnout. Everybody had their rap costumes on, their jewelry, their makeup. And that's the first time I got to see how bad people wanted to, to, to have a career in the music business. So I actually, you know what I mean, auditioned the first time, only got 30 seconds. And then, you know, they told me to, all right, next. And then, you know, that was it. But if you watch the, the, the first season of the show, he did the initial um, talent search one time. And then he picked Chopper, Babs, and a couple of others. And then he didn't feel like he had enough to continue. Then he did the whole scout search again and then went around to the cities again. But by that time, I had befriended um, my man Jay Black. He was the one that was working at the radio station, the parent company that was holding the competition in my city with Bad Boy and MTV, which was 103.9. Jay Black was the program director. When he found out that making the band auditions was coming back to Philly, he gave me a call and said, just come back down and audition again. Don't get discouraged. We're going to do it again. Just come down and give it your all. And the second time is when Harv was there, Jay Black was there, and MTV exec was there. And that was the second time Was the second time I actually made the callback list to audition in front of Puff at 42nd Street in New York. So I had to audition twice. Okay, so Puff at that time, he was bigger than life. When, when you got to stand before this man, was you shook? Was you excited? Did you feel like, yo, this is what I've been waiting for my whole life? I fell into a bunch of equipment. They had equipment <laughs> set up on the stage. I fell into a bunch of equipment. Um, what happened was, when I got the call back to uh, audition for Puff in New York, I was in Renton, which is almost like two and a half hours out the way. So we got the call at 11 o'clock that I was supposed to be there at 12. I didn't leave right until like 2 o'clock. Just bullshitting. But then my cousin finally talked some sense to me like, yo, go. This might be your chance to really make it. This might be your chance. I'm like, <coughs> they're not looking for me. I'm not marketable. You know what I mean? Blase, blase, just giving all excuses. So actually, we left two hours after I was supposed to be in New York for the audition. So by... By that happened, and we got there extra late, so I just told my cousin, let me out the car and go park. I walked past the whole line, which was wrapped around the corner on 42nd Street. I just went to the front door, knocked on a glass door, and then the staff member came out with the little clipboard. I told him my name, and they said, oh, you next, and pulled me straight from the street to end line about the audition for Puff again. I didn't even wait in the long line. I just went straight Philly style, went straight to the door. Fuck that line. Yo, I'm the call back from Philly. My name, Lloyd Mathis. What's up? They like. What's your name? Lloyd. Oh, you next. And then pulled me straight in there. So when, when, once I get the audition for Puff, he told me to um, say my name and where I'm from. I said, Enes from Philly. Then, you know, the beat came on. I think it was the victory beat. And then before you know it, I I misplaced my foot and it fell into a bunch of equipment. A <laughs> keyboard, a drum set, a mic stand, a guitar. Like totally bust my ass in front of the whole Making the band puff. Miss Combs was there. His mom was there. Craig Mack was there. Rest in peace. Like the whole bad B5 was there. The whole entire bad boy MTV staff. I was so embarrassed. But that kind of fueled me. It angered me in a way where I didn't give a fuck. And that attitude, not giving a fuck, is what kind of like fueled my energy to have a good audition. And then, you know, the rest is history. After I did that, he asked me, was I okay? I got up, dusted myself off, I spit my rhyme, and I made. I'm, I was on a list to, to make the boot camp. Okay, real quick. Do you remember the rhyme you spit? Um, Back when Mac made moves with Puff, I was on the back block making moves with stuff. Don't lose an inch or lose the sense that God gave you. A lot can't save you. The Glock raised you. 50 feet in the air. You come back willing to chair. All that stuff be killing my ears. That's just part. That's like eight bars, but like that's how I started off. Yo, like I said at the top of the so show, I you wanted bad it was spitting. Back when Mac made moves with Puff, I was on the thinking, thinking. I had so many rhymes and so many stuff. I just was going through my rhymes and rollers. That's just saying, what could I say? What rhyme can I say that got his name in it or reference something 
remotely close to what's going on here. And, and just brainstorming, that rhyme popped into my head. Boom. Damn. Okay. Where was you when you found out that you actually made the band? What you mean for the callback or audition or actually make the group? No, that you actually made the group. I made the band. We was all sitting in Mr. Childs. We got picked in Mr. Childs. I got picked first out of 40,000 people and I didn't even make the first initial audition. I had to make come back on a second spin around. On a second spin around, I came back and they waited for me, basically, because everybody was picked from the first time they did the talent search. They went to Baltimore, they went to Miami, they went to, of course, New York, they went to uh, Cali, and they had got everybody they wanted already. They had Lowe's from Baltimore. Remember, he was like a shoe in to be like the leader of whatever was going on. But he walked away from the show because he didn't want to be tied down to a group. So they kind of like did the whole thing and just got me out of the second time they did it. They didn't they get nobody else. Just me and, because Dylan was already there. Uh, uh, Chopper was already there. Fred was already there. And, and um, uh, Sarah was already there. So once they did the second talent search, when they go to all the cities, I'm looking for talent. That's the one that I made. So, and then when they went to go pick the group, I got picked first out of 40,000 mm. people. Yeah, you know, I got, a, I got a question for you. By the time that you got picked, did you ever hear any of your bandmates spit before? Did you, did you have a sense of any of their styles? I'm from Philly. So they locked us in a green room for 48 hours. They told, they told you you couldn't leave. You couldn't go to the bathroom. They wanted to see how bad you wanted. It was motherfuckers in there like, yo, I got to go home. I got to check on my kids. I got to get something to eat. I got to get some smoke. They was like, yeah, when you do, don't come back. <laughs> so I you. <laughs> So I use my time wisely. I'm from Philly. I'm a street nigga. I'm from the projects and I love hip hop. So my thing was just to start a cypher in the green room. So that's why I kind of kind of sustain my dominance, um, my lyrical ability by having a big, gigantic freestyle in the green room where they was held in us for 48 hours. So everybody after the after the cypher was over, I had the whole room saying, yo, if you don't make it, Ness, then this shit is rigged because you had it. Everywhere from Dylan to Sarah to Chopper to Fred, the whole everybody was saying it, and that was my that was my uh, strategy to become popular within the, the contestants. Once we get in line, we have all the contestants saying, "Yo, the guy Ness from Philly, he's tough." That was my strategy because I felt like I was always playing from behind because I wasn't one of the original guys that got picked when they first did the talent search. So my whole shit was strategy. Rapping, all that shit, like going straight up to the fucking window. I'm going door, not waiting in line, not being compliant. All that was my strategy. Okay, so I got it. When when, when you did get matched, because all of y'all styles are different. You and Babs Bunny might have the closest, you know, in terms of your styles, but Dylon very different. Freddie P very different. Oh, for Chopper sure. very different, and obviously. Um, Sarah, she's an R&B. Like, could you respect what they was bringing to the table? Because they didn't spit, like, like they wasn't necessarily those lyricists. Or did you respect, I know they don't spit like me or um, come from where I come from, but they just as dope yeah. in their own right. So it's, it's funny. Okay, so this is how I break this down. Coming from the East Coast, you know, we, we pride ourselves on lyricism and it's just being authentic. So, of course, I'm from the street. Of course, I'm, you know what I mean? I'm portraying to be a tough guy. I'm in yep, my mid-20s. Yep. So, I kind of understand that aspect of the game. But during this whole time that we're be auditioning, the South is really kind of putting a chokehold on the game. So, they're, they're kind of, as, as the competition is going on, they're giving Chopper and Fred and guys like that more airtime to spit. And I'm noticing that. And I'm like, a East Coast label would be more geared to how I spit or, you know what I'm saying, how me and Babs get down. But I can see what they was trying to do. They was trying to be, they was trying to make us into the new Fugees with, with, with a touch of Lil John and Trick Daddy and that whole Louisiana flavor and had Dylan for the food, the, the kind of Caribbean feel and have Sarah in there for the Lauren Hill effect. 
That's what we were supposed. That's his idea of what we were supposed to be. But the answer to your question, they was catering to more the South because the South was selling a lot of records back then. Yeah, yeah. So that's why we have Chopper and we have Fred. But to answer your question, I I, I like they raps. Did they have enough? No, they didn't have enough raps for me. But like I was in my mid twenties, they was all still kind of like in their early twenties, and Chopper was a teenager. So I I, I didn't. I kind of judged them by not having so many reps, but what they had, I did like. And at the time, you know, we we we, we went on to, you know what I mean, uh, have writing sessions where, I, you know, they would open up their writing, but I wasn't impressed by first listen. But after a while of being around them, I understood why they was there. Yeah, I asked you that, because like you, I'm from the East Coast, right? I mean, we we were bored up you had to be serious with your wordplay. Serious. You you had to be serious. Like the bars you spit, they like you can't waste the ball. All those bars got to be flames. So even though those guys were dope in their own right, it's still, this is not how you was raised. You come from the streets. You come from ciphers and you come from battling. They didn't spit like right. that. So I was just wondering... Because now all y'all are stuck in a group together. You know, it's only human. Okay, it's only okay, natural see, well, that you might look could, to the right and the, to the left that's where the and be quote, like, yo. Quote. It's a compromise thing. That's where I understood, start understanding the business a little more. Because like I said, economically, you know, the culture was shifting. And a lot, and a lot of South, Southern rappers was getting a lot of looks, a lot of recognition. So to balance the group out, okay, we had the two East Coast rappers. Now we got the two, you know what I mean, down South rappers. And now we got a singer and we got a reggae artist. Um, if it was me, I would have replaced one of the South artists with a, with a West Coast artist. Rest in peace, Damone. He just he just passed early this year. Um, but oh, yeah. I, to, to balance it out a little bit further, I would have picked one down South artist and, and chose... Uh, um, either male or female West Coast MC. I think it was too many presence of South and it kind of overpowered the other parts of the group. And it just, it just, you know what I mean? I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what, what Puff, what his air was at. And, I, and I'm not questioning where he was here. I'm just saying we didn't gel because it was always a thing, the North against the South. So we would get mm -hmm. into a lot of issues because all oh, you porch monkey niggas, oh you uppity niggas, and it just was like it just was bad energy sometimes, and it, and not for nothing you know, we was all kids, so we we just was being ourselves. But to balance it out, I think it was just always like the North versus South civil type of war. Then we had a wild card with Die Line. Then we had another wild card with Sarah. So it was just like unorganized confusion to me. Okay. You know, at the end of the day, while you was finally living out your dream, I'm 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 a signed artist. I'm working with one of the biggest moguls in hip hop history. You still filming a reality TV show, and they got you For locked sure. in the house with five other dudes that you never met a day in your life. So you got to navigate through. Number one, I'm trying to be an artist. But number two, I don't even know these people. I don't even know these people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then on top of that, they took a, they took out all the distractions. Like we had to use one phone against all six of us. We had a landline that we all had to share. Then we had we all had our separate managers that was trying to come in and kind of comfort each one of us. Then we had our own separate crews. And then it just was a lot going on. And it just was, it, it made for good TV, but uh, uh, factually, when you're trying to put a group that never really gelled each other, it just made for better TV than it made for better music. Mm -hmm. uh, how long was y'all in that house? 13 weeks. Each taping of the, um, every season was 13 weeks. So for so a full 13, 13 weeks, 13 and then we weeks. take maybe like four to six weeks to do the editing. 13 weeks of taping, four to six weeks of the editing. So for a full 13 weeks, you were literally locked in that house 
were strangers. Obviously, y'all were not strangers after 13 weeks. But right, right, right. Okay. But you like it's like coming, it's like coming up in the military or going through boot camp with somebody. Like we already was at the at the beginning process. About time we got to actually making a group, we kind of ha had an idea of who everybody was. It just we wasn't in close living quarters, like like filming the reality TV in the same house. And you know, they took away we couldn't read no magazines. We couldn't have outside company. We couldn't use our own personal cell phones. So, you know I mean, in the kind of way, and they didn't do statistics on this. You put a certain amount of people in a small space and you take away certain things, they're going to go at it one another. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's just human instinct. And um, like I said, for the show, it was good TV. It was good reality TV, but for the best product, the cameras was working against us because every time the cameras was on, everything would be highlighted. Any smart remark, any type of roasting or any type of belittlement or any type of uh, um, disconcern for anything would be turned into a big thing because the cameras was on. But as soon as the cameras is off, everybody, the best of friends, kumbaya, we passing food, we passing L's, we passing bottles, passing bitches. And you know, it's not until the camera comes on where, nigga, what you say? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, let me ask you. But this is a disclaimer. I was never signed directly to Bad Boy. I was always signed to Black Key um, Production Company. So when it was time to make the actual group, you know I mean, it was it, 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 it was a lengthy process because they didn't know that I was signed to a production company already. So it, they hesitated for a minute. And if you watch, go back and watch the clips on MTV, they, everybody credit Sarah for for holding off and not signing the uh, paperwork. But the, I was the one initially that said we shouldn't sign it without getting a lawyer to look at it because of what I was going through with my Black Key deal, production deal. So I was I was used to all the linguistics of, familiar with all the linguistics and the contract and the numbers and all that. And I just didn't, wasn't satisfied with what they was giving us at the time. And I the one who talked to Phil Robinson, which was our manager at the time, to go back in and see if we can get a little bit more, you know what I'm saying, and send it for us. Mm. How much was y'all deal worth? Um, he's got twenty five thousand a piece, so twenty five thousand times six, being fifty. Our deal's worth for being fifty. So each one of y'all got twenty five stacks. And yeah, that's, twelve that's fifty events. Twelve fifty, twelve five per. Uh, Upon signing, you get the, the, the rest when you hand in your album. Okay. How, how did that math break down? Because like you said, everybody so for everybody in the world that thinks everybody, when you hear these big advances and all that, they don't get 100% of the money up front. And that goes with anything. Any of these reality TV shows where it's a big purse, where you win a big purse at the end of it, you have to usually wait until... The end of the show and all the legalities in order to get your money. So we was really officially off TV back at home waiting for those advances. Like the TV had already been taped. The editing process was over. And even though the contracts were signed, we were still waiting for the money be because of how TV is put together. TV, you see it today, but it was recorded maybe two, three days ago for the editing process to come in. If you're watching 106 in Park today, it was recorded two days ago. They're just saying the day that you're watching it now. They record in bulks. So they might have three segments a day where they record the next three days for, for, for 106 and Park. And then they have a break and then they record the next three more days for 106 and Park. But it was all done in one day. Like when I do my freestyles, everybody think it's, 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 it's in different days. But sometimes I treat it like a job. I, I do six different outfits and do six different freestyles. And you thought six different times. But really, it was the same one day. One haircut, six outfits, six freestyles. Yeah, people don't I just understand sit in different that. Different parts, go in the car, sit in the crib, go over here. You think it's six different times? Damn, how you come up with this shit so fast? But all I did was wear six different outfits and sit six different places. <laughs> so now I got six freestyles for the month for my content, so I can just post them whenever I get ready instead of doing them one by one. Strategy. That's how TV works. Reality TV is not like it is today. Back in the days, 
you were on the very, very early stages of reality TV, especially in terms of making real artists into stars. Nowadays, it's accepted. You know, you can have a Cardi B go on a love and hip hop. Her light shines through their platform and everybody in the world take her serious as an artist. Now, this is what I want to say. When we did it, it was uncharted territory. Even though you had the first installment, we're making the band with the old town and all that shit. We was the first all black cast for the making the band, for the making the band imprint. So what I want to want to tell you is even up until the infamous cheesecake walk was totally proof that not even Puff knew what the fuck to do. He was just winging it. He was just buying his sub time to try to come up with some other shit for us to do because he had nothing for us to do. It's that fast. He signed the deal. He did the auditions. He picked his camera start rolling. There wasn't even enough time to sit down and devise a whole plan for us. So you was watching it unfold as as it was as you was watching it unfold. We was literally stuck in a hotel for two or three days. They called us to the studio. We was we had cabin fever for being in the hotel all fucking weekend. So when we get to the studio, we kids. Yo, when we gonna get in the studio? He like, when y'all gonna get in the studio? I better slow down. Yo, go over here and do this. But that's the same shit he had to do when he was under Andre Harrell. He had to go get dry cleaning. He had to go retrieve this and that and this. And it's the same shit. So he was like, shit, if I did it and I'm looking at, I'm a multi-million dollar motherfucker, why can't y'all do it? It's just a military exercise. Some people call it humiliation ritual. Some people call it just getting pure out played. But it's a military exercise. It's to bring the members of the group closer together, even if he has to be the tyrant in the situation. Because we have to be on tour selling a product. So we're we not in unison. How are we going to sit together when we're not on the, we on the road? Military exercise. It goes down all the time. You know what I mean? Military commanders do it all the time to their platoons. All the time. Now, you know, looking back on this, hindsight's always twenty twenty, and And obviously, I hear it in your voice. You can respect it. Back when you was going through it, could you and your bandmates respect what he was doing? Really having a trial by fire where y'all had to prove how bad I really want this thing. Nah, we was kids. And other people seemed to like, um, you know what I mean, Diddy just was like, you know what I mean, just throwing his power around. But it's like, you know what I mean? I'm going to say this. The military guys is not coming home telling you exactly what happened in the military, the process. Guys that work at the, guys that come up from the police academy, they're not revealing the inside things that the, the, the normal civilians don't know. The only thing that made us look bad is because you actually got to see the hazing process, the, the artist development process, and people didn't, it didn't sit right with people because they didn't know this is what goes on. So, you know, hip hop is real braggadocious, real machismo, and to, 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 to make an artist look less than in front of the eyes of the whole world. Some some people just didn't want to get behind it. And just just different energy coming off us when the show was over. It was look made us look like some guys that just was doing what another guy said as opposed to people that was really living a dream and really, you know what I mean, embarking on a a fruitful career in music. Yeah, but that's what kind of where I was trying to touch on Earlier in the conversation, I was, you know, nowadays, whether you go on reality TV or not, people accept you as a real artist. But back in them days, no matter how nice you was, it was like, yo, I don't know if we could take these dudes serious because they, they they didn't come from the streets. They came from reality TV. So, right. Y'all had backlash, not just from the viewing audience, but from other artists out there. That didn't give y'all the props like, nah, I really spit. I really do this. I just happen to be on a reality TV show. Puff told the hood fellas to come at us because we we bumped a lot of people. So you got to understand, Black Rob was waiting on his second album. Loon was waiting on his first album. So we kind of like took a lot of attention. But see, we was just pawns in a bigger scheme. 
Puff was coming off his case. He was trying to revitalize his whole image. Bam, MTV. Like I said, and I mean, it wasn't made for us to win for that show. That show was particularly to revitalize his image and to show people that, you know, he actually does give a fuck about the next generation coming up. But the way we was hazed, it just didn't sit right with the overall hip-hop community. And then they was kind of done with us before we was actually got started. So hence we have me, an East Coast rapper that's trying to prove, 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 plant my flag in New York, which is one of the most hardest markets to, to, to overcome when you when you and begin a rapper. Because not only are they going by skill, they're going by authenticity. And how much truth is behind these guys' raps. So seeing me in that type of light on reality TV is like, this guy is not really who he say he is because in the raps, he want to kill you, but then he's doing something that another man said to do. They don't understand really the mental fabric that goes into being an artist. Sometimes you have to play leadership. Sometimes you have to play soldiers. Sometimes you have to play, you know what I mean? You, it's many hats you have to play. Like sometimes, some days I didn't even rap. My whole day was spent around getting people in the studio, waking people up. So when people say Puff is not talented, that's not true. Because it's talent in managing other people. It's, that's a talent. If I called up 10 niggas right now and told them to meet me at, at the same place at the same time, maybe four of those 10 would, would actually do, do that. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to really have talent and mm -hmm. artistry. It's, it, it's a big talent in managing people and their artistry and their skill set. Yeah, I mean, um, y'all y'all wasn't easy to manage. I remember those days. We wasn't. Um, we wasn't. Everybody yeah. say, like, we got fucked over, but we wasn't that, wasn't that um, fucking compliant as a group. We was dysfunctional from the rip. We had a few guys that wanted to actually do it and 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 continue on with the shit. Like we had one album and we got breached the contract before our second album. Like you gotta understand, for everybody who's mad at me because I didn't sign a publishing deal, but they really threw another advance and another marketing budget down the drain when they walked away. Yeah, yeah. You got Dylan saying this and Dylan saying that. We gagged him and we he wasn't even part of the group throughout the whole fucking process of the fucking show. The nigga wasn't even there. To the point where we start getting his money because it was oh, going to, into the pocket of Jason and whoever else was on tour with us. Yeah, we start asking for his money because he wasn't performing and we was actually holding him down, singing his parts to the songs. Okay, so why wasn't he showing so to up? say we was just the fucking angels and darlings of the label, that's not true. We did a lot of fucking over too. Puppy spent two million to bump a lot of other artists to get us to where we was at. And we repaid him by just totally being dysfunctional, missing flights, and, and doing, yeah, he could have did more. We all could have did more. But I'm telling you, the bottom fucking facts is niggas didn't want it as much as they thought they did. When it was time to put the jersey on and really suit up, everybody felt like we, we was old more. They was treating us like kids. We were kids. We didn't have no leverage. We didn't sell no records. Yeah, see, this is the part of the story and this is bigger than MTV making the band. It's bigger than your group. It's bigger than Puff. You just said something that's just real. I mean, I hope people pay attention. Everybody say they want it. But when it comes to putting in that work, like, like legitimately putting in that work, you come to find out for yourself, I don't want it as much as my mouth say I want it. I'm not saying niggas was nice and niggas didn't want to have a fruitful career in, in music. I'm saying when it comes to the business aspect of music, people are not complying with it. And there's some things that they won't compromise to be in music business. And it's a combination. You can't just take over a block with pure physicality. It has to be a strategy. You have to be a thinker and you have to be a mover and a stepper. A lot of people just okay with being steppers. Some people just okay with being movers. Some people can be being thinkers. 
But when you put all these things together, then you unstoppable force. And like, I'm, I'm not saying niggas wasn't nice. They just didn't want to be in the mu music business. Okay, so when a person like you, who is, I mean, let, let's just keep it 100. You was on the run when you even got- I'm 25. I, I'm 25. I'm getting older. You know, the, you know, the game only wants you from a certain age. When I got to the show, they was only asking for 16 to 24. If you, if you realize, I was 25. I was over the age to make the group. I wasn't even supposed to be there. But they didn't have another nice MC as me to, to build the group around. So they had to continue with me. I was 25. Sarah was 24, going on 25. We auditioned in September. I, my birthday is in November. So by the time we even got picked to do the show, I was already 25. So to answer your question, I was already done with the whole artist development, waiting, not knowing. I had I had a, a, a direct line to a hip-hop mogul where he was leaning towards actually giving me a career. I was done. There's no more, there's no more to think about. But in that process, I began to absorb the game a little bit more by being up under him, not asking questions, just watching and observing and understanding that this shit can move without you. They can replace Ness and get somebody up in here that looks exactly like Ness, put chains on Ness, give, give them Ness raps and make a whole project out of that. And I understood that. So it's not really about your skill set. It's not really about um, anything else but the opportunity and what you're willing to do with it at that moment. Yeah, that's real talk. That's real. That's that's real talk. Um, Y'all came out with a banging first single, "Bad Boy This, Bad Boy That." Like y'all killed yeah, which that. Which was my hook. Single. That was my hook. I wrote. I, you I wrote, wrote that hook? hook? Maybe sixty percent of the song. Yeah, that was my hook. Uh What you mean? You wrote sixty percent of the song? Like you wrote some of the other band members' um, verses? All right, bang, bang. Royalties are split into two hundreds. Two hundred. 200 royalties, the mechanical royalties and the performing royalties. So 50% goes to the producer automatically. So if you produce the beat, 50. The other 50 is spread with the writers, right? So if I'm writing my verse and the chorus, because the chorus, you want to hear it more times in the song. So if I wrote whatever you hear more times in the song, that means I wrote more percentage of the song. So say if I get on a record and it got me, Chopper, and Babs, and Sarah's on the hook, but I wrote Sarah's hook, that means I wrote the hook and my verse. So I get a bigger percentage of the 50% that's left over after the producer gets his 50. So what I'm saying is I wrote a majority of the single that spearheaded the group to, to sell over 500,000 units. So that was my first mission. That's what Puff gave me. All right, nigga, I'm not going to just flat out and be heads over heels for you. This is your first uh, mission. This is your first task. See what you could do with this group as the spearhead, as the leader and the spearhead of this group. I mean, I didn't go crazy out the water with the numbers, but I did establish that yeah, I can write the music that 500, over 500,000 motherfuckers will go buy it. And that established myself in the game as a writer. Mm. Yo, you know I should have tapped on this earlier. Because you you briefly touched on that walk for cheesecake when when right and this is gonna be something that people are gonna be asking you to the day you die because it's such an iconic no, moment. It, is. it really is. Like you was part of one of them moments, like them hip hop moments, pop culture moments. Everybody know that walk for cheesecake. First and foremost, Everybody. how long did it take for y'all to walk out there? To Brooklyn to get that cheesecake. It was three hours, three hours up, three back. So that was a six hour. We actually trip went to was on. We actually went to Wall of Flame and joined. Is anybody in Brooklyn in the next forty eight hours? Go to Brooklyn. Make sure you get me going there. Go, look to your left. They actually dedicate a whole Wall of Fame to the actual distance, the date, the time, the characters, the cast members, everything. We on the Wall of Fame and Juniors in, in Brooklyn. Okay, what, what a lot of people don't realize is it wasn't just y'all walking. That, that joint had to be filmed. That no, was the whole, everybody. 
the whole staff, the cameramen, the camera crew, the niggas holding the boom mics, the security, the niggas with the guns. All every everybody was walking with us. It wasn't just us walking by ourselves. The whole production team, the whole making it band, MTV bad boy production was walking alongside us. You just didn't see it. Okay, so when y'all was taking that walk, or better yet, even when he told y'all, yo, I want some cheesecake, was y'all looking at him like, yo, this dude is just plain sunning us? Or was at you looking first, at it? Because you, if you look back on I'm the only one that said something. When he was like, Philly, you ain't even nice. We all, we like, fuck it. The nigga don't, all right, fuck it, we ain't doing it. So we was outside, and then I guess he was leaving, coming out. And he was like, yo, what the fuck y'all still in front of my studio for? Y'all don't want to walk? Go that way. And I'm like, bro, no, we just feel as he was like, man, listen, that's, I don't really care how you feel. See if y'all going to do it or not. And you, that's when he just turned his, his energy towards Dylan. I wrote a letter to get you out. Like, the way we showed appreciation, we, I mean, I mean, you know, the way we did it, it just, it was just, it just, it just was bad energy. Because Dylan got, he was the initial me. He got a letter of, a letterhead. To get him out of his situation early, when we were still in the boot camp phase, I didn't get this until like later on, maybe before we actually got into the house. This was Dylan's story from the rip that he had legal trouble. Yeah, they didn't, yep. they didn't, they didn't publicize my legal trouble. So for him being dysfunctional and not showing up to shit, it kind of like, bro, this nigga got you out of whole bed, like literally. And then what he did for me. Like I couldn't like like I like I said like you said, I touched on it briefly. But when we were wild out, I I could wild out with him, but not so much because I mean, my alternative is like nigga, you in our care. You don't want to do what we say. Go the fuck back to Philly. And go to jail. That's, 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 that's the alternative. That. So, I, <laughs> like, you feel me? So I could wild out with my band members and really like jail with them, but it's. On the legality side, I'm like I'm really, I'm really up here and they care, bro. I'm, I'm really up here and they care. Some happens to me. I'm in Puff's legal care. He has to answer for me because I'm under a uh, judge from Philly's probation. It's a court order. It's like you can't get around it. Yeah, I mean, um, I forgot, and you just reminded me that was part of Dylan's storyline. Was that he was in trouble? I forgot all about that. And, and and to think he was one of the main ones who ain't want to do nothing. He was always, you know, bucking and going against the establishment. But I, I completely forgot because I'm thinking about you. Uh. They didn't publicize my shit. They publicized his. We had yeah, the same yeah. issue. He just was a little bit further. He was going through the court process. I already had went to court, did time was on probation and had went AWOL and was on a run. So I, my shit was a little bit deeper. Like, I, my shit is already, nigga, you already know what you waiting for. Was waiting for you back in Philly. Yeah, I mean, so uh, people say, I forgot all about that. When people say, walk for cheesecake, I knew he was dead serious because I knew in his eyes he didn't have anything else to, for us to fuck to do. I knew it. I'm older. Like, I'm the guy that's watching and my eyes ain't big for nothing. I'm sitting around. I'm hearing shit. I'm air hustling. I'm being a fly on the wall. I'm hearing. He doesn't have anything for us to do. So as we're going back and forth and I'm tongue wrestling with Puff, he just freestyled. Well, nigga, walk for cheesecake. By the time y'all get back, I has, I think of some more shit. That's that's literally what that was. Nothing. It wasn't him trying to send us. It was him freestyling like, ah, damn, I want a piece of cheese. Matter of fact, go get that for me. That was that was that was, what that was. Yo, it's crazy because I'm going to tell you something. In the office, we used to, like, we literally used to have to write stuff for y'all to do and submit it. So that's, this I know. Is, what you're saying is real because as part of the staff, <laughs> as part of the team, we used to have to write stuff like, yo, we think they should do this or we think they should do that. So he was definitely running out of stuff to give y'all. So you see, as it as as the making of band installments went on, the Danny and Kane, day twenty six, they upgraded everything. They was in Miami and for Danny and Kane, they was riding around in the Bentley. Nigga, we only had two service, fifteen passenger vans the whole fucking competition, all our seasons. We didn't have the trucks until we damn it had an album out. So yeah, like you know what I mean. 
we was uncharted territory. Puff didn't really know anything about reality TV. He literally just signed the deal and the cameras cut on. That That's how that went. So everybody that saw, oh, man, y'all want the cheesecake, y'all got son. The nigga literally didn't have anything for us to do. I wish people would let it go. But since they didn't let it go, I turned lemons into lemonade and I came up with my own cheesecake line. So make sure y'all holler at me on Instagram at, at Ines Cheesecake. I got my own cheesecake line. And it's dope. and it's fruitful. It's doing well. Dope, 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 dope. Yo, you know something? You mentioned in a lot of names during this interview. What was some of the artists that was signed to Bad Boy when y'all was signed? Shannon, Sherry Dennis, um, Kane, um, that's all I can remember right now. I know it's it a lot, a lot of us, but I'm the one who actually brought French Montana up in there to do a Cocaine City DVD before he got ever got thought about getting signed up or, or doing any business with Puff. Lexus was the, uh, uh, uh um, um, she was the intern that's working in daddy's house and she knew French Montana. She asked me that I want to do an interview and I asked her who it was and she was like, the nigga French Montana, he knew the Cocaine City DVDs and I'm like, all right, fuck it, let him up. I was in there recording for some other shit, some other shit Puff wanted me to do and I had let him up in there and this was around the time that they wanted me to battle the nigga Shells on the Fight Club. That's when the Fight Club started getting crazy because after me and Jay Mills did our battle on TV, that's when the battle shit went up through the roof. So that's why I say I'm one of the pioneers. Yeah, it's always been battle rap before me and Mills battle, but we highlighted it on a highly publicized and highly popular MTV reality series, which was making the band. So after that, I'm getting all the calls to battle. Even Puff wanted to do the rematch for the, for the third season, but I said no because the shit that me and Jay Mills went through started spilling over in the street. Like I got approached by them niggas at the Mitchell Power Summit in Puerto Rico and like, you know what I'm saying? Them niggas was real street niggas. So, you know what I mean? You know, niggas was getting on DVDs, talking their shit. And then I had, you know, seen them down in Puerto Rico. And they, you know what I mean? They got in me. Me and Mills got into it. Niggas surrounded me. I was by myself, mind you. So, like, yeah, I got, I, got, I got some stories. I got some stories. So, but Puff was keep pushing it for the, uh, for the rematch. But I'm like, nah, Puff, there's just too much bad energy, man. Niggas is like, niggas is moving funny. And I'm just trying to be done with that. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm in New York. I don't have the protection that I would have if I was in Philly. Niggas got to drop damn to two hours. Even when me and Babs went through our little shit over the hair, she was calling niggas from Brooklyn. Even though she didn't say she was calling niggas, niggas was coming here just to check on her well-being, and they pulled up. But being that I'm in Philly close, niggas was pulling up the same time her niggas was pulling up. Mayno, all them niggas pulled up. June Balloon, everybody. So Babs was, was, a, was a real... Chick from the street back then, she had real niggas pulling up. And I had my niggas pulling up from Philly. Damn, see, I never knew that backstory on why you um, and Jay Mills never had that rematch. I didn't realize that it started spilling over into the streets. Yeah, niggas came at me. Niggas tried to make a move on me. But you know what's ironic about that? I ended up, uh, damn, what's my guy? Nigel ended up being my A&R. We start working on music. That's so crazy. Nigel and Tone, they, they, they was the guys that yep. was behind one to blow that got J. Mill signed. And him and Puff was good friends. That's why I really never went too far. But yeah, Mills felt some way because, you know, we, it was the DVD era. And I was watching DVDs and, you know, Vado is J. Mills, man. You know, Vado, that be with Cam and shit like that. That's J. Mills' guy. So it was DVDs, but they was like, fuck Ness. So I would see that. I would go in my DVD interview, say, fuck Mills, fuck Wanna Blow. And then the shit spilled out in Puerto Rico. Like I said, I was by myself. I ain't held, I held it down. I ain't bitch. The niggas definitely surrounded me on some shit. Mm. Yo, th that battle is like one of the, the highlight moments. Because you done battled everybody. But that's one of them highlight moments in your battle career. Probably because it was it was live. It was It was filmed. Is there no, anybody sure. who, who gave you a, a, a crazy, difficult time when it came to that battling? Or for you, I, I mean, don't know nobody ever, ever, ever going to give me a difficult time. Will they say some hot lines and get some reactions? Of course. Anybody, it's like, you know what I mean? If you play ball, you play ball. You know what I mean? Even if you, 
You know what I'm saying? Playing Jordan, you're going to get a shot on them. You know what I'm saying? You, you're good for one. So niggas might, you know what I mean? But I'm, I'm, I'm one of the greats. So when you say something against one of the greats, it's always going to be highlighted. There's going to be a big emphasis around it. So nobody gives me trouble. Now, when it comes to a thing where if I had enough time to prepare and be prepped for it, like when I battled Jay Mills, I knew I was battling Mills, but I didn't know I was battling at that moment. Yeah, we was at the studio. We were set to be recording, ready to get in the studio to record. They put the whole Jay Mills shit on me at a, at a moment. Matter of fact, I'm lying. They did call me and say he was around the studio talking shit. Nobody can fuck with him and all that. They did give me the call. So we actually was in the studio waiting for them to come. But then it was in the wee hours of the night. I was back in, in, in B-Lounge sleep. So they're like, Mills in America, come on. So like, I woke straight up on my sleep and, and battle. It wasn't like I had time to prep or get my rounds. So when you see the battle going, I mean, as it, the battle transitions from the, 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 the three stand rounds to the five sudden death rounds, that's just me pulling rhymes out my hat, just going crazy, just going in full battle mode because I had new Mills. Me and Mills was at Mutual Friends from Poster Boy, my nigga Shaheed out of Harlem. You know, they was all managed by Kuda Love. Kuda Love managed Mace. He managed Poster Boy and he managed Cardan. So they was my my guys way before me even making the show because I was already fucking with um, Black Key. Black Key was coming up here fucking with Hip Dog. Hip Dog knew Mary J. Blige. He knew Jada Kiss. He knew Sheik. He knew uh, Ghost. So we was already fucking with niggas in New York prior to that. So uh, prior to me coming to New York doing actually taping the show, I'm in Philly. So I'm already back and forth trying to make it. Having me into playing my demo, battling J Hood in front of uh Jada Kiss and Yonkers. I'm already doing the whole rapper shit at that time. It's just I knew niggas and then I didn't get my shot yet. I was over the BET Awards when Nelly won the shit, when Nelly was the shit. They was Nelly was signed to Cooler Love also. So you can see I'm not I'm making pure sense. Around that time, I was fucking with niggas. Niggas just wasn't giving me my shot. And niggas wasn't opening their doors to give me a situation. When the making the band situation came, Puff came to me like, yo, nigga, I know there's some fucked up shit, but this is what you got to do. This is you paying dues. Let me see what you do with this. And then we, you're, you're promised the future over here. And and he did that. Mm. Crazy backstory. Yo, I saw an interview with you before, and you said you thought you was blackballed from the industry. Why is that? Um, nobody did, never did nothing with me. Okay, you got to elaborate on that. I mean, a lot of these rappers, even though it don't be a smooth transition, they get to go other places and make music for other imprints. Like, I was one of the guys that brought, like, Kanye West to the, to the, uh, make it a band crib to submit beats. Mr. Bentley kicked the nigga out and then signed a good music two years later. Mr. Bentley didn't even know who Kanye West was at the time. You see what I'm saying? So I had other options. And you know what I mean, even though I never exercised him at my time being on Bad Boy, after the Bad Boy situation was over, nobody really reached out. And like it was like what I was getting is that, no, nah, because Puff, you know, I want Puff to come back. And da -da -da -da, even though... That wasn't the case. I had after he moved on and went to um, Atlanta, um, Interscope and moved and passed. I mean, and, and moved on from Atlantic. Then I had no legal um, obligations to to him any any longer because that was the extent of my contract. He went to a whole nother distribution uh, situation. He couldn't take the roster that was Atlantic over to Interscope, so that null and voided the contract. But under people's perception, I still had ties legally bonded too puff and nobody was willing to do the research no matter what I was telling them. So I just felt like I wasn't per se blackballed by him out of his mouth. Just the dark cloud that he cast on me by not, you know what I mean, actually putting me out in the time frame that I had and just not nobody taking interest in me after that situation. You know, I always wanted to ask you this question and I didn't even know that was the angle you was coming from. You, you What you mean? You're clearly nice. You you are nice with the lyrics. You're nice with rhyming. But I but nobody nobody from that band ever went on to get solo deals, and I never understood why. No, I did. I got a deal. In, I got a solo deal in '06. That's what I'm saying. Puff kept his promise and gave no, me no, a no, solo no. Deal, I'm talking about after the, after the bad boy situation was done. 
Right, nobody, right, right. Nobody right, went right. on to other labels like, yo, you know what? I'm a free agent now. Sign me as a solo artist. You understand where I I'm mean, coming from? Yeah, it wasn't like, I mean, I know factually I was doing music at a high volume. It may not have been um, major releases, but as far as the mixtape game, you know what I mean? I kind of had a chokehold in a mixtape game. I had a, I had a uh, Gangsta Grills out that really did really well. And, you know, I, mean, I had a mixtape series, my hate mail, my Rama Crime mixtape series. It got write-ups in the source. And then me and Babs whole thing, they was going to package us as a situation. But then she didn't go with the deal. Then I was left with a solo deal. And by being that I was in a production, meaning we have, I mean, shared a control of, of the music. Puff left it up to us to do the music. You know what I'm saying? So it was really like Puff was just a the, 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 the major company that was giving me an opportunity to put my music out through my production company. So what I'm saying is I, I did good business and it wasn't like the business was bad. Just nobody felt as though, you know I mean, I guess I was valuable enough to um, actually give me a situation after that situation was over. And the way I got my solo situation, I mean, I got down to my last couple thousand dollars and I just rented a car and went up to go holler at Puff. By that time, I had a good relationship with not only Puff, but with the security. So that's how I kept ties on him at um, over all the years because Paulie and them fuck with me, Bondi and them fuck with me. It wasn't his his staff per se. It was the nigga that was holding him down. Like we fuck with you, Ness. Anytime Puff around, we gonna let you know where you at, and we gonna give you access because we already know how he feel about you. He fuck with you. So that's how I got my solo deal. I just was grown man shit. I rented a car, went up to New York. I mean, when it was on Broadway, went to the office. Everybody greeted me, the whole, the same National Guard niggas that uh, Jada Kiss was talking about on the radio. They love me. Them National Guard niggas love me. Nice. <laughs> High fives. Puff upstairs. I went upstairs. I was cool. I was the nigga that was going and going, go fuck with, going to the office and talking to the marketing, talking to the, the electronic division and tech talking. I'm that nigga. So by the time it was coming to get my solo deal, I already had a rapport with everybody in there. So. So whenever I go in the building, they just would direct me where Puff was. Like, yo, he's in his office. He's over there. Puff, yeah, go holler at. I mean, let's go holler at Puff. Because I was good with everybody. I would go holler at Mel Gibson. I would go holler at this one, that one, that one. I was a nigga that tried to learn every every department. Because Puff was Puff was looking for was self-sufficient artists. Nigga that would go work their own uh, records at the club. Nigga that would go do their own beats, record their own sessions, try to mix their own records down. So he tried to bring us up like, Super soldiers. So I was that nigga. I was going to the the little uh Sean John internships, learning that shit. I was going over here. I wanted to learn the shit that he was giving me access to learn, and it helped me all these years. Helped me have skin tough when I was being ridiculed for 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 picking for picking that situation, and it just gave me a lot of good things and tools, instruments I use to be resilient to make it enough to where I'm actually doing well now. And having this second win and everybody's receiving me and it's not distasteful or it's not to where niggas tired of it. Niggas just like, damn, that was actually nice. Fuck. What? We not up. You know I mean, so people are starting to catch up, but it had to take all those times put together with the way the social media is and the way the Internet climate is and the way digital world is for, for, for me to be here and to be thriving like I am right now. Yeah, that's real. Um, you know, you mentioned you mentioned a couple of key names, and I want to ask you, uh, Uncle Paulie, head of security, Roger Barnes. Um, yeah. Did Did you know Did you know Gene Deal at the time? Was he even up there when y'all was there? I I, I watch a lot of Gene in because you know I've, since you know everything. It's been just crazy energy. I just been watching shit, old shit, old videos, old shit. So I mean, I speak, see Gene speaks on a lot of things. He speaks on a time where he was there when Biggie was there, and then I think around a time where I guess actually we did the show is when he kind of made his separation because then he speaks of as if he was there right after, which was Danny Lee Kane's installment of making a band. 
So I don't know if he skipped when we was doing the whole show. We was isolated so much that we wasn't around puffed enough where we seen Jill. But I, I have no memories of seeing Jill, me, seeing G. Maybe I did. He just didn't give me that, you know what I mean, that standout personality or maybe, you know what I mean? But I, I didn't really see Gene too much at, at all. I, mean, I don't I think he was there. I don't, I don't think he was there Gene. at that time. But I heard him mention y'all name. I've seen a recent interview where he speaks, you know what I mean, about, you know, you know certain things. And he bring my name up a couple of times as far as, like, you know, Puff kept me around to do certain certain writing certain writing um things for him and shit like that. And, you know, he does say later on in the interview that the only one Puff kind of had time for was Ness because Ness had, you know, was writing shit for him and, you know, you know, they would try to, you know, that's what Puff do. They would try to get niggas to write for him and take their publishing. But this is another disclaimer. Puff never owned none of my publishing. He never owned it because I was signed through a production deal. So whatever um, um, agreement I had with my production deal for my publishing, that was the agreement. Puff didn't have no, no, no papers on my, my, my publishing the whole time. So when Puff recently gave back the publishing to all of his artists, it ain't like he right. owned your publishing to begin with. So was it like no. he could even return it? No, no, he could never return it. Puff gave me a lot of things that artists such as myself don't win up front. He let me retain my merchandising. He let me retain my publishing. He let me retain a lot of things. And in his defense, and I'm nobody's lawyer, he gave me a lot of things up front that he's not supposed to give me. So... So meaning if I would have came out with an album, I really would have went up front instead of the company that I was signed to because I was signed to my own production deal. So Puff didn't have nothing invested in my project as of he just signed me, gave me a budget and told me to do my thing. He didn't have no investment in the publishing. He didn't have no investment in the merchandising. So if I would have came out with my album just like, it was a partnership. It was like, yo, we I, we take our bread, y'all take our y'all bread. In all the years that you've been signed, have you ever seen the royalty check? Yeah, I seen like one or two. In all the years you've been signed, uh, I mean, I want to tell people for real, for real. Getting back in money on, in the music business is like almost second to none. I mean, you really have to fight for your money. I just want to tell people it's not a common thing. They just don't have, they just don't sign, make these checks and just hand them over to you. You have to really do a lot of digging and you really have to do a fight for your money. Not only, I'm not talking specifically about the situation I am talking about any company, Interscope, Rock Nation, anything, fucking Universal, Def Jam, like it's designed for you to hunt down your money. It's not designed for you to just, just pop up at the label and they give you checks. And that goes for any fucking label. Nah, I don't think people really realize that. Um, it is not common in the music industry to see them royalty checks. More times than not, an artist is going to make their money on the road. It's just that simple. Shows is what buys them the big house. Shows is what keeps them and their family eating. But if you're sitting there waiting on a royalty check, you're going to be waiting for a long time. So it don't surprise me that you, in 20 years, didn't see but two royalty checks. And speaking of that, was them royalty checks big? That's what. That's how many. That besides how many royalty checks I seen. And I also got bamboozled by my lawyer because I gave them a power attorney at the time. Who was your so lawyer? I had all my checks forwarded to um, my lawyer, which was in New York. So all my money was going to to keep it. I mean, track of everything I had. I mean. Gave my lawyer power attorney, so all my, all my, fucking royalty checks would go straight to my lawyer, and he ended up not, you know, what I mean, reporting a couple checks to me, that I found out years after the statute of limitation is over, and I and I actually had a personal conversation with him, and all roads was leading to him stealing my money. So even I, I want to make this disclaimer: even your personal lawyer and managers, you have to, you know, what I mean, watch them closely also because they're making a quick buck too. Power of attorney is what it is. It's power of attorney. Meaning if you forward all checks and all, I mean, traffic as, as far as um, economically and financially towards your lawyer, they can abuse that privilege also. And that also happened to me. Who, who was your lawyer at the time? Was it still, because you, you mentioned the name up front in the interview. 
Ed Woods. Ed Woods wasn't my wasn't my lawyer no longer after that. Um, I think Ed Woods had passed after that. I had a lawyer named by the name of Corey Body. Okay, but you're speaking about York. Ed. Yeah, Ed was Black Keys manager. My he was my lawyer by default because I was signed to Black Keys production deal and Ed Woods was his lawyer at the time, his entertainment lawyer, which structured the deal. Ness, I talked to Mark Curry not too long ago, and he was talking about ghostwriting for Puff. I heard you bring that up briefly. How, how much ghostwriting for Puff did you do? Um, a lot, a lot of a lot of ghostwriting. I've been to all the Puff's houses, ghostwriting. He got a studio in every joint. Puff really loved hip hop. I mean, that's one thing I say about him is at his success, stay with a studio. And for him to be successful and as common as he is, he loves hip hops that much. Like he has a portable studio in 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 big ass Hampton cribs and fucking the Star Island crib, got a separate crib where we record at. Like I never seen nobody as as as, as accomplished and successful him still love music and hip hop the way he does. When he doesn't really have to. You know what I'm saying? He's He's done well in all types of genres, not only music, but fashion and, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and liquor and everything else. So it's like for him to still have that love for music, and I'm a testament to that. He still appreciates rhymes, metaphors, cleverness, wittiness, song structure. Absolutely. He still, he still appreciates that. And that's why I respect him so much, because at any given moment, he could wash his hands with this shit, because he he's one of the pioneers of the shit. You know what I'm saying? And he's still attacking from that level. Did you get a chance to listen to his love album? Nah, he actually wanted me to write on it. I had talked to him a year ago. And I just seen him at Coney Island and shit when he um him he did the uh the day party. But uh, make a long story short, he wanted me to be, uh, be a writer on, on 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 that album, but just scheduling differences didn't pan out. But I heard a few tracks, but you know what I mean? For me, to me just Realistically, um, a lot of these guys don't know Diddy's accomplishment. There's a younger generation now. Everything is faster. And I think just people just don't appreciate him as, as well as they should. And um, to some extent, I think the music game is just kind of moving past Diddy. And they want to remember him as a figure that they know is accomplished, but they don't know exactly what he did. But he just one of those guys. So for him to put out music, I mean, it's cool, but you know what I mean? It's just, it's so much the way we receive and purchase music and the way we listen to it, it just, it just have a small shelf life. And somebody as Diddy that's attacks it, as passionate he is, the gems he dropped and the projects he dropped don't get swallowed up in the fast paced, um, cutthroat music business. If that make any sense. Nah, I do. And you know, I gotta, I gotta give you your props because we, you know, we 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 all know. No, I, I don't through... want to seem too political. I'm just speaking from the heart. Like it's like everybody is, I mean, giving a, a certain testament, and I want to give it a testament from my true testament, not a from a bashing ass point, not a dick rod ass point. That's why I'm giving you both sides of it, the good and the bad. So I just want to speak from a truthful standpoint on this, and you know, big up what I seen and and and. Tell the other side of it, the, the little horror stories too that come with it. It's not all actual alley comes from that certain person. Everybody think it's puff, it's puff, it's puff, it's puff, it's puff. We got jerked by Mel Gibson and the management more than we got jerked by Puff. That, that's what you want to say. Because, you know, they was getting money for us and we wasn't reporting it and we was responsible for that money to the IRS. Damn. So people got money on your behalf and y'all was the ones who still got penalized for it for tax purposes? Yup. Damn. That's crazy. But but like I was saying, I, I, I got to applaud you because 
right now, Puff going through it. Um, it, it it's no way to sugarcoat that. He's going through it. He's not having the best month. No. But you could have just as easily come on here and do what a lot of people are doing. They're using this as an opportunity to kick a man when he's down. So I got to say, right. I respect the fact that, yo, Prez, I can only speak about my relationship with this man. I can only speak right. from the standpoint right. of the interactions I had with him. That's it. That's all. But, you know, you see a lot of people with my band members speak out and how, you know what I mean, it kind of, you know what I mean, left them in, you know what I mean, in a bad position. And, you know what I mean, I don't want to talk about that because that's, everybody say that. That's that's their truth. And that is. But I'm just telling people my thing. And I'm not just going to, just because everybody's stoning this man, I, I'm i not going to use it as opportunity to stone him also because that's the how, not how, how we carried it. That's how he carried me. And even though the business didn't go well and I didn't come out with, you know, the quote unquote standard bad boy album solo, that, that man gave me two opportunities to change my life. And I was living in Philly 25 years and not one Philadelphian gave me that opportunity. That's real. See what I'm saying? That's real. <laughs> That's real. Feel me? <laughs> Yo, what... What do you say when you see somebody like Freddie P, you know, go on live and he's crying? And you Fred know, don't like when I speak and speak speak about him on these interviews. And out of your respect, I, I'm I'm gonna just leave it at that. But I will say this: like I said, everybody's story is different. He feels a certain way. Babs feels a certain way. Sarah feels a certain chop. Dylan, me, we all got our certain type of way we feel. The way he expresses it is the way he is expressing. And um, as a disclaimer, I'm going to handle it the way I'm handling it. He's going to handle it the way he handled it. He's going to deal with it the way he deal with it. That don't mean I got to go out in a blaze with that man because he feels that way. And we we was all, and to some, to some extent, was uh, did in a certain way which wasn't ethical. But I'm not going to run out in a blaze of glory because of it. Because I got other things to worry about and other things I cherish. Yeah, I love music the fuck out of it, but will I just go to jail because of it? No. I'm smart. I know how to do other things. I know how to get money other ways. Music is just a big part of my story, and I'm good at it. And I mean, and, and it helps me, I mean, spill into other business adventures by being a public figure. But all in all, I think, I mean, we had enough time to recalibrate and get it together. And that's just, that's just basically from my standpoint. But I'm not going to sit by and just watch nobody say something and be like, yo, you shouldn't feel that way. Nah, I can't tell you how to feel because I'm not in your mind, in your body. And you know I mean, I'm not in your heart. So I can't I can't dictate the way you should feel. Do you believe that there is a bad boy curse? You got people running around and and. This is this is coming from within the camp, not just people outside. Like, yo, there's a bad boy curse. Do you buy into that, or you just think every man got to he got to be responsible for his own actions? Um, I mean, Puff, I ain't gonna lie. Puff told me that when I was up there, he's like, "Man, you got the curse of the band on you." And I'm like, Puff, what the fuck does that mean? I'm like, I'm really doomed if you saying that. <laughs> so it's like my whole. My whole career been an uphill battle. Like I said, I dug myself out the hole. I dug myself out the darkness. Nobody else did it. Everybody kicked me when I was down. It just Puff is more successful and more established. So it's going to be more heightened. It's going to be more highlighted. But I've been through the same things. Not to the point where hit the accusations, the allegations that he made and the extended allegations. I'm just talking about personally attacked for not being successful and not making it from the hood. And I had to live with that on my back for 20 years until I finally reevaluated my situation. Like, it start with me and it's going to end with me. Yeah, Puff was a good vessel. And that was a good person to meet. But I love music. So if I can't get on this fucking camera, on this phone and rap and just show people what I can really do, then my name ain't what it is. And I did that for six months straight. And one door start opening after another just by me taking it back 
to my DVD roots and just saying, fuck all that. Fuck the drip. Fuck the money. Fuck the failed careers. Fuck the false starts. Fuck the disappointments. Fuck the regrets. I'm just going to rap and see where that takes me. Do you get paid for your battle rap? Yeah. It's called the performance fee. Win or lose, draw. We each work out an agreement and a contract with the Battle League for a performance fee. That's dope. That's dope. People don't realize, people think that, the, you know, a lot of the battle rappers, as nice as they are, they not getting paid for their performance fee. No, they getting paid. They getting paid some big bucks. Cassidy, which is, you know what I mean, a good friend of mine, he's from Philly. One of the, one of like the pioneers of the, 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 the revitalized battle rap era, I would say. He gets up to six figures, almost, almost to a milli. That's crazy. People wouldn't even know that, bro. Real talk. We doing pay per view. We get we get percentages off the pay per view. We getting big performance fees. We get merchandising. We get all types of shit. We get endorsements. Like a nigga paid me fifteen hundred dollars to wear a shirt and a hat up there with the word Cigarello on it. So you get to keep your endorsements, or you got to split it with them? No, that's all pocket money. That's going straight into my pocket. I don't have to. I don't have to share that with anyone. Same thing with my freestyles. A lot of I'm a brand ambassador, so when I do a freestyle and it go viral, then I get brand ambassadors, a black 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 owned companies, black clothing companies, small clothing companies that that pay me to wear their merchandises on my freestyles. So my actual Instagram is a business. I lost my I lost my initial page. It got hacked. Them overseas foreigners hacked my page. That's when I started knowing the importance of social media. And it's all smoke and mirrors. But, you know what I mean? For the most part, people can see that, you know what I mean? I really love hip-hop. And, then you know, it just wasn't all a fluke. And I wasn't wasn't a just a reality TV star rapper. So that's why I decided to go back and battle rap. Battle rap to show the hardcore fans, the hardcore hip-hop fans, that I'm one of y'all. I'm not one of them silver spoon niggas that walk the yellow brick road for a deal. I'm one of them niggas that came from the trenches, that came from the bottom, that get in your face, tell you I'm going to shoot you and kill you and fuck you up, and then go make a record. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That'll sell. I did both. Before I let you up out of here, you, you've, had a, you've had a very up, down, and everything in, in between career. If you could go back in time, what would you change? I just would be up there. I would be up New York more. I just probably would have stayed up there instead of going to Philly, wasting time with niggas in Philly telling me about this and that when they really couldn't do nothing for me but follow my lead and what I was doing and just have an input on what I was doing instead of being, you know what I mean, there on the ground level with me, actually making the moves, just stay up around puffing them. Not, not even giving them no, no breathing room. Just my whole experience up there just with them. Because I know what was Philly was waiting for me. And the more time I spent in Philly, I found myself getting away from what I really wanted to do. I gave Philly 25 years. So giving it any more time, even though it's my city and I love it, this is my career choice. And the same thing with military men. If I got to go to war for four years, that's what it is. What the fuck? You know what I mean? I ain't going to be able to see my family, but you know, I'm protecting the motherfucking country. And that's just what it is. And I feel as though I spent too much time being in Philly or being other places than being in New York Really, 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 really being around the professionals and the playmakers like I should. Yo, with that being said, brother, I appreciate this conversation. Real talk. I appreciate sitting with you. Uh, I was there when you, you were, I wasn't there when your career started in Philly, but I was definitely there when um, the world came to know you through, through that whole MTV thing, man. I'm proud of you. Just keep up the good work. And I love that you are going back to your roots. You just spit in flames. And because of that, it's starting to take you to the new heights in this whole rap thing. So keep up the great work, man. Like, like I'm proud of you and I appreciate you sitting down with me. One love, brother. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love. Make every move a power move. And I'll catch you all on the next video.